Hello, 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 and thank you for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and we have a special episode this week. We have Alex Cunningham joining me as co-host and asking me a bunch of questions. So we're doing the first Q&A episode. And what we have here is questions that run the entire gamut. So a lot of stuff about ketosis, some stuff about carnivore diet, additives to foods, my favorite guitar pedal, how I think about sleeping and what type of pillows to use. We cover it all. So this one is something that was sourced from you guys, everything you wanted to know. If you like it, then send me some more questions. We'll do this again. But otherwise, hope you enjoy. Before we get to the episode, I wanted to chat about our sponsor, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto is all about making a ketogenic diet healthy and accessible. Whether you're reading all of our online guides or articles or enjoying Perfect Keto's exogenous ketones or any other keto-friendly products, everything you need to make keto work for you is at perfectketo.com. I know what you're thinking. Hey, aren't you the founder of Perfect Keto? Yep, that's right. And all of my insanely high standards have been put into making each and every product. My background as a functional medicine clinician helps me craft the cleanest and healthiest possible products and best information about the ketogenic diet. Head on over to perfectketo.com to learn anything you need to know about the ketogenic diet. And if you've never tried any of our products before, feel free to use the code Keto Podcast for 20% off your first order. That being said, let's get into the show. All right. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you so much. I'm a longtime listener, first time <laughs> co-host. Yeah. So funky little episode we have today, throwing it up to a, a new format. So we're going to have Alex. I did a little AMA on my Instagram. Source the best questions, and Alex here is going to help out. He is head of partnerships at Perfect Keto, and he is a keto fanatic himself, and he's going to help out with, with answering some questions today. Yes, indeed. Thank you for having me have you on the show today. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> we have a lovely landscape. We're at the Martha's family's farm, so my, my better half's family farm, Minnesota. It's watching the sunset. Have our ketones porch ready to go. Cheers. Cheers. Salted caramel. Both mm. of us, huh? knockout mm. ready to get after it so i didn't i got i sourced the questions from my instagram i did not i figured it would be more interesting for me to just go off the cuff and answer them as they came so alex will ask them and i will answer them but i've done little to no research i figure that that would be a manufactured and weird answer so we're gonna go for it hit us off alex okay let's do it are you ready for the keto answers hot seat dr anthony gustin yeah hit, hit me up okay first out of the gate is from Jane Age Downs. She's one of my favorite keto fitness uh, influencers on Instagram. Um, her question is, do you have any information or research you can refer me to that supports using a carnivore diet to help heal gut issues? And I think this is interesting because uh, there's a lot of skepticism about it. I know I certainly did wondering about what happens when I have no fiber, what will that do to my stomach? So uh, any research, uh, or information you can refer me to using carnivore for gut issues? Yes. Um, no like direct researches or studies just because this diet is so new for right now. But if you just look at what treatment is for a lot of gut problems, people think that fiber, needing more fiber is always the answer and it's actually the opposite. So podcast episode with Dr. Michael Ruscio, we talk a lot about this and how fiber is actually a lot of times the the cause of a lot of symptoms you have with gut problems. So if you have an overgrowth of gut bacteria, or if you have what's called small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, or you have the bacteria that should not be in your gut in the first place, what happens is you, you eat fiber and you give them a lot of food to digest on. Also, if you are eating a lot of fiber and you have a gut problem, your gut is damaged or inflamed, what will happen is you will basically always be churning stuff through your gut and having your gut squeeze through all this fiber and try to get some nutrients and some moisture out of that fiber. So basically, you're putting your gut to work 24 hours a day if you're eating high-fiber meals. And so... While when I was in the clinic and there were people with gut issues, one of the main treatments that we would do is actually put them on a zero fiber plan to help give their gut a little bit of a break, kill off some of the bacteria. And that's exactly why I think carnivore diet is one of these things that works so effectively for treating things like gut problems. I think that a lot of people have outstanding gut issues. And there's a lot of crazy estimates out there, but 50, 60% of people potentially have gut issues that they do not know about. And so this is something like, it's, it's not just your gut issue. So like, it's not like you have diarrhea or you feel cramped or bloated. I have a gut issue when I eat wheat. And what that issue is, is certain protein from the wheat gets through, goes to my skin and reflects with acne on my face. I don't get any digestive issues, but that's, a, that's technically a gut problem. I got screened a couple months ago because I had uh, food poisoning a bunch this year and I have a lot of inflammation in my gut due to that, but I have no gut issues. And so these are things that people think that the only thing to have an issue with is your gut is if you have gut symptoms, but that's not always the case. 
So uh, that's that's one of the reasons why I think carnivore diet works. I did a video on this on YouTube. One of my my YouTube trial did three videos a couple like a month or so ago. I'm gonna trying to be get getting back into that a little bit more. But one of those is why I think the carnivore diet works, and I kind of go into depth a little bit more about this. But it totally makes sense that it would help out more people than it would harm. I've never seen any problem where people take out fiber and it's been a bad thing. If anything, in the short term, it's been a good thing. That being said, carnivore diet's been crazy. The more I think about it, the more I think that while it's great in the short term, it's not an answer for m most people in the long term, unless they have some sort of autoimmune condition where, for instance, they have so many intolerances and their body is so on guard for other food pro products that they can't have anything. And so... For instance, Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson. Like, did you listen to the Jordan Peterson Joe Rogan episode last month? I did, just you, a couple of minutes. Yeah. So at the end, Jordan Peterson talks about how he has gone his whole life with depression and autoimmune conditions and all this, like teeth problems and all this different stuff that being able to go only to meat has been the only thing that has helped him thus far. People like that, I think long term carnivore is great, but I don't think that for the average person, it makes a lot of sense forever. I think it's great to resettle for a lot of reasons. Like when we did it, I think one of the things that you also mentioned was that you figured out that you were just snacking too much. I think that I was, I was that way too. hundred percent. Yeah. So, so fun fact, Alex and I did the carnivore diet together along with Martha and Alex only lasted what, two, three weeks, 18 days, 18 days. in six hours and 31 minutes. How many seconds? Oh boy. It got dicey at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I was at eating sushi or I was at a sushi spot and yeah, I just blacked out and ate a bunch. Oh, it's not the one that we were together. No, it was the next day. Oh, wow. That's sad. It so, was yeah. secret sushi. So why didn't you continue with the carnivore diet? Kind of get off topic, but just curious. Sure, yeah. I actually felt very, very good from you know day 10 to day 18. I know you did as well. And beyond that, up to six weeks, I was feeling outstanding, but I was feeling just bored uh, or just kind of like just wanted to eat more food. It felt like kind of a just a tough diet to adhere to. It was as tough as any diet experiment that I've ever done. But I did feel really good, so it was uh, it was a trade off. Yeah. So there are some benefits to, to carnivore. I don't think it's a realistic long term thing for people who don't need to do it. But if you're interested, give it a shot. I think it could be good for a lot of gut problems. So a quick follow up. Uh, you know, you can use it to help heal gut issues. But then, how would you go about not going back to those same gut issues after you do a carnivore pro protocol? Yeah, that's a good question. I think depending on the severity. But just going on a carnivore is not going to fix all gut problems. It's going to help with a lot of people, but some people are going to need to have specific herbs and botanicals, maybe even prescriptions like this thing's called uh, like a rifaximin that is an antimicrobial, antibacterial that kills off certain SIBO and gut strains. And so depending on the severity and how long you've been having it, these symptoms can, re can resurface. And this is one of these things that can be recalcitrant where it just comes back over and over and over again until you really hit it with a carpet bomb, essentially. And so that's where, yeah, it can, for some people, it can, it can fix a lot of stuff and reset. But for some people, it's like you need to work with a functional medicine provider and, and figure out a more detailed approach. It's just so different on an individual basis, the, all the factors that go into it. But good question. Great. Um, so kind of going to the topic of adding back things into your diet and what would be appropriate. Uh, a brave soul had the courage to ask this question. It is... What is your take on sunflower lecithin and guar gum in almond milks? This is coming from Slam Chops One, and this is actually my personal account. <laughs> and this is where I knew that you'd be an excellent co-host here, because this is a great question that I don't think a lot of people ask. But it's one of these things. Looking at the back of a package, I always try to highlight on my Instagram story, for example, the things that I think are weird in foods, and these are two things that I think are a little strange. So, when you look at stuff like almond milk and all these different food products that seem kind of healthy, they have these additives in them because we need to stabilize foods to make them look great, unfortunately, or else people won't have them. And so this is one of the products or one of the problems that we've been having moving forward with food uh, R&D with Perfect Keto is that our standards are very, very high. And so we typically don't like to use these type of ingredients. The way I like to think about it is soy lecithin is not... Like these things are in such microscopic amounts and there's not much evidence on soy lecithin being actually bad for you from a nutritional standpoint. However, what you're doing there is supporting the soy industry. So what happens is to, like, to get soy lecithin, you take a soybean to make soybean oil and you put these solvents in them. And then you take the, the solvent 
processed oil and then you put it through this degumming process. And the degumming process, you get soy less, lecithin. And then you powderize that and you make that into what's called a stalize. It's like this powdered oil, essentially, that comes from processed soy. And Got so it. at that point, like, yes, it is processed, but to a certain degree, you are, and if it's GMO from soy, it has like those other things. You don't have to worry about the phytoestrogens from soy, like all the other bad things. We can have an entire podcast about how soy sucks, but I think that it, it, it's taking away all the proteins and all the bad stuff with soy. And you're, you're processing it so much that I don't really think that you're getting any pesticides or anything negative from the GMO. So it's one of these toss up ingredients. If you can avoid it, I would say, yes, obviously avoid it and don't worry about your food separating. But should you really care if it's in there? Like, that's one of these things where, like, does having almond milk with soy less than in it help create momentum where you make better choices? If that's the case, then I'd say go for it. But I don't think it should be something like where you go out of your way to remove that completely. If it was, soybean oil i would say yeah get that shit out of here and like toss that in the garbage i'm not a fan of vegetable oils but but when it's you know it's it's this leftover product from manufacturing it's not we haven't really seen that much negative stuff to it and so i'm a little skeptical but if you can avoid it certainly avoid it and a lot of times too people freak out about this stuff but then they have a cheat meal once a week and eat like shit yep it's like this is the most minor of thing that you could possibly worry about like, like not eating carbs and saturated fat in the same meal is probably way more beneficial than worrying about soy, soy, uh, sunflower or soy less than or any less of things. And that's exactly what's going on in my mind is like, I kind of freak out about it a little bit. I'm drinking the almond breeze, almond milk. I'm thinking, should I go for the just in premium quality almond milk that actually separates? And, I, you know, I, I guess the, the answer is, you know, not that big of a deal. As yeah, long as, not, that, you know, not, not that big of a deal. But if you can, and if you have the means to get that, that baller almond milk, I would say go for it. Um, as far as guar gum goes, going back to the gut issues that we talked about with, with Jane, there is actual evidence. So guar gum is a, to, to actually pull back a few steps here, guar gum is not a weird processed thing. It's actually from guar beans, which grow in India and I think countries over there. Uh, but yeah, they just take the beans and smash them down to this little paste. I don't know exactly how it's processed, but they're from actual beans. However, there is some evidence that in a, in like basically I think 20, 25 grams, something like that, which is a lot granted. So there's some skepticism to ha be had here, but it does actually feed a lot of those bad bacteria and cause gut dysfunction. Hmm. So if you have any gut problems or you know of any gut problems, for sure, I would just avoid it from that perspective. Now, if you have none of those things, and again, you're worrying about this as far as an added ingredient, like it's not super processed, it's not crazy comes from a real thing i'd say it's another one of these fringe things but we we do have uh, evidence that to a to a high degree like if you're eating a ton of it you have gut problems or you can make gut problems you have worse and so it's something to, to be mindful of i think if you are on like a gut elimination pro program obviously working with a good provider will do this but reducing all of these things and um it's called fodmap so fermentable oligosacc oligosaccharides disaccharides uh, monosaccharides and polyols would be a good thing. And I think guar gums would fall into that. And so just removing that so less bacteria can eat. The guar gum would be a good idea. So again, a, fr a fringe ingredient, don't sweat over it, but if you can avoid it, avoid it. Right on. I think I will treat myself to some baller almond milk. Do it. I'm worth you, it, you right? Earned it. You earned it. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, the importance of working with a functional medicine technician to really nail down uh, the gut issues. And so the next question comes from Hey Eddie. Uh, he says, listening to your podcast and the guests you bring on have been great. However, getting in touch with a functional medicine doctor, depending on where you live in the country, can be difficult. How do you go about finding a practitioner you, uh, how do you go about finding a pr practitioner like yourself to maximize our nutritional efforts so we don't have to feel like we're on the outside looking in when we listen to your podcast? It's tough. This is a real problem that I, w I was actually going to start a business for this. Um, I just don't have time for it right now, but somebody please out there who is listening who is a little entrepreneurial make a functional medicine finder i've talked to a few people about doing this as an initiative there's just no good consolidated resource i started as a side project a couple of years ago this thing called movement providers i can give you the tech behind that on the website if somebody wants to do this uh, i just do not have time for it but the the biggest thing you can do now i mean this is a this is really tough because it's one of these places where there's no really 
legitimized area to look at as far as training goes. And so you can look at the Institute for Functional Medicine has a really good program. Chris Kresser has a phenomenal program uh, that I actually went through. It was the first class that, I mean, I just, I know the back end of the program and I know what he offers. It's, it's phenomenal. And so, I mean, you can Google and Yelp and Google uh, functional medicine providers and see what comes up. And then honestly having conversations with them and interviewing them, like you should be doing with any physician in my opinion. And so asking them questions that you believe in, like, do you, do you think, what, what is your philosophy on food? And if anybody talks about eating processed food or not being about real food, you can cross them off the list. I mean, do you support a ketogenic diet? If they say no, then just go keep going on the list until you find one that does. So this is tough. Also having a functional medicine provider, Dr. Rushi and I talked about this a little bit as well, that will order $5,000 of tests right up front is kind of going a little on the deep, uh, on the deep end. And so again, finding somebody who's willing to work with you where you're at and take a survey of your symptoms and family history and not over order everything is another, I think, red flag to avoid. And so, yeah, I think it's tough. So looking at those things, like seeing their credentials, if they have any, I think in this aspect, working with a naturopath, working with a chiropractor, working with an MD, doesn't really matter. I think that everybody here is equipped to be able to serve you appropriately and looking and, and interviewing them. And then also just, just having that top of mind as far as testing goes, but they're not trying to gouge you on $5,000 with the testing up front. So yeah, I mean, it's tough. I wish this problem was solved, but it's good. I think, I think it's trending in the right way, but please, again, anybody reach out to me if they want any information on how to start a company around this, because I think it's super important. I think there's a lot of different models you can make it work, but yeah, this is something that needs, needs to exist. So I apologize for not doing that yet, but maybe someday. I'll just echo that. I saw a uh, movement providers in action and something like this needs to be on the internet. Um, so we're talking a lot about specific ingredients on keto and how it affects um, your insulin and blood glucose. So the next uh, question comes from Eat Berry Healthy SF. Question is, I've seen a lot of keto people talk lately about how sweeteners like stevia, monk fruit, and erythritol can affect your insulin. What are your thoughts on these? I do not think that that's the case from what I've seen. Um, so you, you can get in the weeds with some sugar alcohols, but not the ones that were mentioned. So stevia, monk fruit, and erythritol, um, I just am not really a big fan of erythritol because of the way it tastes and where it comes from. So talking about the soy lecithin stuff and this, so erythritol basically comes from GMO cornstarch. I don't know if you knew that. That's how it's made. And yeah, I just, I don't like the way it tastes. I don't like supporting monocrop corn fields. Um, and yeah, that's just my personal opinion. So that's why I don't consume a lot of it. Um, stevia and monk fruit, I have measured extensively stevia sweetened things. Obviously that's stevia monk fruit, two things, sweeteners that we use in our products. And I found no incidence of it raising any sort of glucose in the short term. And then I also test my insulin all the time. And I mean, I, I'd say I have stevia or monk fruit every day and I haven't noticed any increasing of my baseline insulin or fasting insulin over a course of time. So I doubt that that's the case, but if you, I mean, test it out. If I would say have stevia based things, have mon uh, monk fruit or erythritol if you want and test them yourself and see does your blood sugar go up. That's going to be the best proxy. I know that you can get some in insulin output sometimes separate of blood glucose, but we, we don't really have a good way to measure that. So I'd say just quick and dirty way, measure your blood glucose and see the response on that. Yeah, it's just per personal preference. I just like the taste of monk fruit and stevia better and I don't really enjoy erythritol all that much. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that, there's a lot of skepticism around stevia and monk fruit and are these good or are they bad? And they come from plants and the research is overwhelming that they could be, they're, they're either neutral or possibly positive when treating gut symptoms. Hmm. Yeah, so Dr. Ruchu actually breaks this down in his podcast a few times and in his book, I think Healthy Gut, Healthy Uses book. And yeah, it's, so it's, it's looking at like sucralose, aspartame, stuff like that is either neutral or most likely definitively bad for you, whereas stevia and monk root are neutral or positive for you. And so that being the case, I don't know the details on erythritol, but that being the case, I would skew towards those two and not really worry about that. Again, you have bigger fish to fry than non-caloric sweeteners, in my opinion. That's wild. So erythritol is derived from GMO corn. Corn starch, yeah. Corn starch. I think that's how the majority of it's done. So speaking on the topic of keeping insulin low, 
Uh, Iglesias Fitness asks, why is it that some people don't see high ketone numbers even when following a strict keto diet, fasting, and they're still achieving weight loss and a low blood glucose reading? Thank you in advance. Yeah, you got it. So assuming that you are a fit guy, since you have Iglesias Fitness, fitness is in the name, I would assume that <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a guy with some muscle mass on you. And I think that that's where you get to see people who have you don't have circulating blood ketone levels because they're being used up by your tissues. So for instance, me, nutritional ketosis looks a lot like 0.8 to 1.0 until I fast for three or four days. I get into like a two to three range, but other than that, that's the case. Alex, similar for you, you're, you're a yoked dude. <laughs> not even, not even, but uh, yeah, I'm the same. I wake up at 0.9 just religiously. I cannot shake the 0.9, but I'm fine with that. I think I feel better there. And I remember... Uh, my first couple months of keto, you know, just chasing that 3.0 number and feeling awful and just like not understanding how to reconcile that. So um, I, I think this chasing ketones is a big kind of like myth uh, that we see out there. Do you think it's as ridiculous as chasing high glucose levels? Uh, I think high glucose levels are relevant, but I think that, I mean, we, I talked to, to Luis from Keto Games about this too, and he said that his his uh, fasting ketone levels are also around like 0 0.8, 1.0. That guy's, that guy's pretty yoked too. Mm -hmm. Um, not as much as you, but the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one of these things where is higher better. And the answer in my opinion is absolutely not like Iglesias. Are you like, what is your goal? Are you reaching your goal Do higher ketone levels get you there? I think there's very few instances where higher is better. So for instance, like if you're treating epilepsy or neurological conditions, or you're treating cancer and you want a high glucose ketone index, it's a very different conversation to which ketone levels actually do matter, and you should probably juice those up a little bit. Um, otherwise, if you're just tr generally trying to be healthy, be fit, stay lean, have good performance in the gym, do not even worry about the levels. It doesn't even matter. And the answer why people differ is because if you have more tissue to be used, metabolically active tissue, you're going to have less ketones in your bloodstream floating around. You're going to have more of them available, or not available, but being used in the tissue. So like, we don't have a way to test ketones that are being used in your tissues. That's awesome. So it's not the blood ketone level that is the be all end all. It's the actual usability from your cells perspective. Yeah. And so people will see too, when they first get keto adapted, they'll hit like 2.0, 1.5 numbers after like a week or two. And then they'll start dipping and they think they're doing something wrong. What's well, because their body's actually more efficient at using those ketones. And so you'll see a spike after about a week or two, three, four, maybe if you're super metabolically messed up. And then after that, you'll go down to you could settle between 1, 1.5, 1 0.8, whatever. I think people always try to reference this goddamn graph that I think was, you know what I'm talking about, right? I was the biggest call for it. The um, Finney or Volek or one of those guys put it out. The optimal ketone range. Right, where it starts at 1.5 and then goes up to whatever 6. And, so and it gets one, red and yeah, fiery. Yeah, and then people think that you're going to die if you get like up, up by four, 4 or 5 or 6. Um, and yeah, I think that that needs to be updated. So that's, that's my answer. That's awesome. Next question. This is from C. Babcock 8. He says, I've listened to most of your episodes so far and I love your work. Sometimes I feel your standards of keto living are unrealistic for, say, a busy parent with a tight budget. I want to hear an episode uh, or a portion of an episode telling an average Joe how to do a deep dive into a keto lifestyle while managing a busy life and budget. For example, what if I can't afford to regularly, regularly buy grass fed meats? It's a good question. Um, I would say that I'm a very busy person as well. So this is uh, something that I can feel. I, I don't really put a lot of restriction on budgeting for my food because it's the most important thing that I, I do for myself. So where we can compromise there, like what do I spend a lot of money on for food? Um, not much actually. So Alex and I both buy from the same ranch, Bar 3 Ranch up in Austin. Like how much does it, is it, do we like a half cow or a quarter cow? $10 a, a pound $10 comes a pound. out to. And we get like the most primo cuts and stuff like that. If, if that's still not an option for you where you can get really good high quality meat, I would say then at that point, get um, if you're going to go shopping and get you're looking at like chain grocery store type of stuff, it's totally fine. Just skew towards the leaner cuts of meat at that point because you want the protein. You're going to be missing out on some of the nutrients. But if you go super lean, you're avoiding some of the fat and green fat animals have more inflammatory fat levels. And so you want to avoid that. So go for lean meat sources but then load up the fats and stuff that's cheap. So like, for instance, you could go to Costco or Sam's Club and get an 18-pound thing of 
uh, coconut oil, for example, or avocado oil. I know that these these things are carried there, which fat is super dense, super caloric, and you can really load those things in. Go there, get some leafy greens, um, get some lean meat, and get some some oils like that. And I think that you're totally set. Um, what are your thoughts here as far as eating keto on a budget or making it? I mean, do you think that you see me eating most days? Do you think what I eat is unrealistic? It seems like it's other than the meat source. It's like it's very straightforward. I have fatty meat typically and like very few vegetables, like some some low fiber vegetables and nuts. Exactly. You it's, can get nuts in bulk. Again it's so it. simple. Yeah. I, I'd have to agree is that, you know, when I'm especially busy, that's when I rely on the ketogenic diet most because I don't have to think about eating every couple hours. Good point. You know what I mean? I can go several hours without eating. And then the times when I do eat, it's a very small meal volumetrically. So, you know, it takes a minute to eat it versus, you know, having to sit down and, you know, chop through some sweet potatoes or something like that. And as far as the budget, I have checked my credit card bills and I spend less money when I'm eating a ketogenic diet. What do you think that is? I'd have to say it's the same thing as, as the amount of volume, you know, I, I eat the um, high quality cuts of meat and then I just supplement with obviously like perfect keto and, you know, a couple nuts, a couple seeds here and there and I'm good to go. Right. And I think that all this stuff you can get now at Costco or on Amazon. So for example, Costco I know has Kerrygold butter, they have avocado oil in giant jugs, they have coconut oil in giant jugs, they have eggs in giant packets, they have lean meats. Like if I was trying to do really on a budget and do it right, I would just go get some, a friend's Costco membership or a Sam's Club membership and just go hoard that. And I mean, just just that alone, I think would be a really easy way to do this. And you made a good point as far as timing goes. Like I spend very little time eating in a day, prepping, mm -hmm. cooking, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very easy way to do it. And I think MCT oil in coffee, stuff like that is a good way to get the calories up, super cheap. Um, I think that, I mean, obviously I, I like ours the best, but there are very cheap brands on Amazon you can get. Like if you need to do it on a budget, totally fine. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's totally, totally doable in my opinion. For sure. And let's see. Next, we have a quick hitter. This is from Phil Chester. Favorite guitar pedal? Nice. Mix it up. So Phil, it's a great question. I unfortunately in Austin... This is going to be disappointing to you probably, but have a really sad setup where I have a tiny Terror orange amp. I just really haven't moved in there. And so my electric is going unplayed at the moment. Mm. But I would say that if I were to build, like if I were to do one, maybe two, assuming that we have a nice stack with some built-in reverb, I would choose a Tube Screamer or probably 808 or a blues driver. Those would be my two go-tos. Yes. Love that crunch, tube crunch, mm. overdrive. Yeah, your guitar is crying out for you in the corner right now. It's lonely. So I have a few stuffed under the couch. I don't know if you know about oh, <laughs> I thought I heard something from under the couch. Yeah. It's crying, <laughs> screaming. Okay, let's, uh, let's switch it back to Perfect Keto products. This comes from My Dog Has a Big Head. Excellent name. Definitely going to be following that immediately after the show. <laughs> Dr. Anthony Gustin, does your new nut butter product have to be refrigerated? So we just launched 2.0, nut butter 2.0, which yeah, yeah. The, the first, the, the 1.0, what happened is in the processing of packaging the nut butter, it took a high heat and got semi-roasted. The macadamia nuts let out a ton of fat and it became very soupy and watery. So... V1 had to be refrigerated or else you were drinking soup. I didn't like that. So we reformulated it and launched a V2, which is like a normal nut butter, I would say. Um, nice, creamy, delicious. Um, uh, at rim temp, I like it in the fridge the most. Um, so that's where my preference is. It doesn't need to be in there. Alex, what is your preference? Uh, I'm a fridge guy because it helps me self-limit. You know, I can't get a full right. heaping spoonful. Like I have to scrape for a little bit and earn my nut butter. <laughs> so I go refrigerated or sometimes frozen. So we went to our place uh, in Brooklyn last week and Martha opened the freezer to get the nut butter out of it. I'm like, what the hell is this? She's like, yes, this is the way to limit the consumption. Because otherwise, I think that we all have a very big problem at the Perfect Keto household and the, the team is that 
we will just take spoonful after spoonful and eat a jar in a day or two, which is just, I mean, it's, it's good, but it's a lot of goddamn nut butter. And so, and so like we're, we're trying to figure out ways to limit ourselves. And this is the one that she found is actually, if you put it in the freezer and I notice this, like you just chip away at it mm -hmm. and it's actually pretty good. It's like a little chewy treat. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Cause there, there's not like many chewy treats on a ketogenic diet until mid October when we launch a chewy treat. Mm. But yeah, the, the freezer trick is, is pretty good too. But yeah, it does not need to be refrigerated. I prefer out there. Martha puts in the freezer to curb her, her addiction. But yeah, good question. I've heated it. Heated it. I'm not gonna lie, yeah. Um, okay, we're on the topic of perfect keto. We have a couple perfect keto questions that are very similar. First one is, I'll ask them both at the same time. Uh, what supplements do you take on the daily? Does that change for you? And I know you're a big advocate of you know, eating and supplementing towards your goals. So what do you take on the daily? And the related question is, how often do you use Perfect Keto products? Which ones do you use most frequently? I promise it won't change my pur purchasing habits, but I'm just cur <laughs> curious. These are from Pundaway and the Ketosis Kid. Basically, what's your supplement regimen and why? Yeah, so this changes all the time. I think I'm always tweaking, but there's been some constants over the years. Uh, let's, let's start with the Perfect Keto. Uh, man. I'm trying to think of like what I don't use on a regular basis. So for me, it's like I, I limit the flavors more than I limit. It's so like I'll go big on a flavor for like a month or two, mm -hmm. and then I want to switch to another one. Right now, I'm super big on the on the caramels, and so I would, okay. So let's break this down a little bit. So I use the exogenous ketones as, for instance, right now, if I'm on like a long call or a podcast, or if I'm trying to crank on work or if I'm traveling, these are the times I use the ketones. Mm -hmm. What about you? Exact same pre pre work session. Uh, I'll do like half scoop, and then I'll sip on the re remainder of the half scoop out through uh, those two couple hours. Okay, um, if it's the beginning of the day and I, I'm at home and I have all my supplements and stuff like that, um, I'm I'm hitting the nootropics for sure. I definitely do the pre workout. See, the funny thing that people don't realize that everyone on the team knows is that I essentially made all these products for me, kind of selfishly. Is that I wanted something to do exist, and so I made them because that's why I was kind of cobbling stuff together in the first place. I've seen your cupboard. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> and and so we have, um, yeah. So for sure. I, so the pre workout looks to me right now, where I put a bunch of electrolytes, the keto pre workout that we have to perform, and a scoop of our unflavored collagen. Mm -hmm. That's my pre workout. You said uh, that collagen has been shown to have an increased bioavailability right yes. before workout. Is that right? Fun fact. Mike T. Nelson put me on this um, study. He sent me a couple studies uh, last year that showed that if you have collagen before a workout and then, so basically what, what you're doing is you're, you're putting a lot of collagen in your bloodstream and then you're getting blood flow to joint services in places that generally don't have uptake of collagen because of lack of blood flow. And so you're juicing up the uptake because you're getting blood flow in there. What happens if you take it after a workout is that your blood flow is restricted and it goes to other places where it can be had. So skin and hair and nails and stuff like that i want it more so in my joint surfaces and tendons and ligaments which which generally don't get blood flow unless you work out mm -hmm. so if you're a female you're looking for hair skin and nails stuff like that or a male not trying to discriminate here then mm -hmm. i would say whenever it works for you i want it more for not feeling like shit after doing gymnastics and so i put it before my workouts um so typical mornings like wake up i do uh the apple cider vinegar tabs that we just re with equip not out yet, but they're out. Um, liver tabs and a probiotic. So I switch that around. So right now I'm doing VSL number three and uh, prescriptasis as a combo. And then do my little morning routine or whatever, and then go to the gym. And we had those two before. And then after that, I do what do I do? The, uh, I'll usually do like a smoothie or something like that or just eat meat. And if I don't eat meat, then I have a quip beef protein. And then I'd say, then I crush the nootropics and then go into work. And then if I, again, if I have any calls or podcasts or anything where I want to be in super edge, then I do exogenous ketones. Um, and then I would say I've been more so with the greens powder, like a once a week, I'm just, I'm just trying to play with this a little bit and see if I feel any difference. But like once a week, I'll hit like 10 scoops. Hmm. Yeah. All in one shaker bottle. Yeah. That's wild. So I'll make like a giant, I'll do a, like one lemon, one squeeze lemon, 
and I'll use the lemon greens and I'll do like eight to 10 skis. Is that to put a stress on your? Yeah. And so part of why micronutrients in plants are good is because it puts a stress in your body a little bit. And so I kind of want to just go crazy and do like a crazy uh, micronutrient stress. And so I don't know. I'm, tr I'm trying to test this out and see if it works for me. That's where I'm at. I think it's super interesting when you pose it that food can be a stress, a positive stress on your body, just like working out can be a positive stress on your body. Yeah. And so that's that. I would say I use the MCT oils less just because I'm getting so much in all the other products. So like the actual oils I use if I'm making smoothies or if I'm making ice cream at night. So I'll do like an ice cream treat. If I want to get crazy, it's just <laughs> half an avocado, a scoop of our collagen or MCT oil powder, um, one of the flavors, ice, and some squirts of the MCT oil. And you whip that up in a blender. It's, it's absurd. Wow. Um, put a little coconut flakes on there or something. Oh. Other than that, um, I try, I, so I do a krill oil typically, vitamin D, uh, soft gels, and magnesium, tons of magnesium and electrolytes. I think that those are my standards. I think I, I always am toying around with something or trying something new. I'm trying to think of what I, I've been traveling for the last two weeks, so I don't really have anything with me. But I, I'm, I'm getting to the fact now, like we have single packets up for some products and I'm just not, I'm not fucking around anymore. So it's just like, I used to travel with like 15 pill bottles and all this different stuff. <laughs> and I'm just giving my body a break when I'm traveling at this point and just taking our single packets because they're convenient. Other than that, it's just, I'll leave everything at, at home. And then I just, I haven't really found anything other than the vitamin D, krill oil, probiotics, and magnesium that I have made like a mainstay of my, of my supplements over the long period of time. Those are the, those are the key ones. That's awesome. So pretty much nootropics and exogenous ketones for the mental performance, the pre-workout plus the collagen for pre-workout, uh, and then just daily krill, vitamin D, magnesium, and electrolytes. And I had a quick question and on probiotics. Pro probiotics. Uh, I've heard things about like if you take probiotics in conjunction with prebiotics, like eating them with fibrous foods, they may have more propensity to take up domicile in your intestines. Is that accurate? Bro, you need to listen to the Ruchia podcast. Okay. You haven't listened? I have. So, I have. My brain is a sieve sometimes. Yeah, so he, he mentions in there that one of the things that frustrate us a lot about gut health is that people think that when you take probiotics, they reside in your gut. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. So when you eat a probiotic, it's not like you get new bacteria in your gut that stay there. So what happens is they actually, basically as they're going through your gut system, they outcompete for other bacteria and basically starve other bacteria selectively. Mm -hmm. And then they have positive signaling aspects to having them in your gut system. But taking probiotics does not lead to more bacteria of the probiotic in your gut. They don't reside in your gut. They don't take up domicile. Gotcha. That is a giant misconception. So it's almost just like in, introducing your intestines to all these probiotics. No. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, technically, yes, but it's not like they they take up residence. Mm -hmm. They just help balance gut bacteria. And it's one of these things where, like, again, I had a lot of food poisoning. I have a lot of rebalancing to do. I have a lot of work to do there. And so that's why I'm prioritizing that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, there's no downside to taking probiotics. The only downside is money. Yeah. So maybe we'll create a probiotic soon. But hey, what better thing to spend money on than your health? Like, I feel like, you well, know. If it's, not, if it's not necessary, like. True. It's one of these things, like, we don't really know how necessary it is. It's really hard to measure. Gut, gut stuff. So like, if, if you have money to spend on it and it doesn't affect you, then I'd say go for it and get them. And if you notice a lot of positive benefit, then you can keep doing them. Yeah, it's one of these things like I man, that's probably still the most thing I spend my my money on besides like rent and food is supplements. I think it's stupid. That's why like I'm always cycling through and like thinking I'm gonna find some new cure. And it's not the case. I have my standards. And other than that, you know, just try, try to keep it lean. For sure. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Oh, turmeric as well, every day. Turmeric, yes. Sorry. Quip. Quip, baby. Uh, this next question comes from Sim Land. He is also an outstanding resource for keto and just all things. Sim health. is the man. This guy comments everywhere. He just has tons of awesome stuff to say. He's always helpful. So, yeah, yeah, thank you, Sim. His question is Dr. Anthony Gustin, what single food do you think you could survive on for the rest of your life? You know what this is going to be. 
Oh boy, matcha. <laughs> <laughs> I would matcha, I would have bro? to say avocado because it has protein, fats. Well, I guess you don't need carbohydrates. Nope, non essential. I, I don't know what the answer is coming from you. Wow, I'm actually shocked. Oh, ribeye. Yes, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What am I doing? I just posted a photo today on my Instagram of ribeye and like. You just bought ribeyes a couple yeah, hours I just, ago. I just bought ribeye. Like, everything about my life is essentially around ribeyes. We're going to bet in the. So we're going to. Vikings Niners game this weekend. The bet's probably going to be about ribeyes. Like, 100%. It, most things in my life revolve around when I'm going to eat ribeye or how I'm going to acquire ribeye or my next ribeye. That's yeah, li- is. life is just time between your ribeyes. Exactly. <laughs> so if that answer isn't clear enough, like, that's like literally, I would just eat, like, when I was in carnivore mode, I was pumped every day. Like, you said you got bored. I was actually just like, yep, yeah, awesome. I just could eat this all day, every day. The only thing that got me with a carnivore diet and eating ribeyes all the time is that it was Austin. It was like 105 degrees every day. And I was just done eating hot meat. Yeah. I was like, it's like grill it. I would go outside and sweat my face off under the grill. <laughs> yeah. And then I would bring it inside and still be sweating and eating. Um, but yeah, 100% ribeye. I think that's yeah easy, easy choice for me. Maybe I should have done the ribeye diet. Or maybe I was just doing too much. What What's your magic island food? Oh, boy. I mean, it's... Now that you said ribeye, I, I would have to go ribeye. If I couldn't go ribeye, porterhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would it would definitely be a cut of meat. I, I just can't think of anything to top ribeye right now. Cool. Um, yeah. Is that all we got, or what, where are we at? One final question. Uh, it's fitting for the end of the day. Uh, we're going to be talking about sleep, which I think is the underappreciated aspect of, you know, being able to eat healthy. Is you know, it starts with a great night's sleep. So I'll stop talking. The question is, Dr. Anthony Gustin, do you have a favorite type of pillow? I've been trying to set up a good sleep environment and can't seem to find a good pillow. And I've asked you this uh, a couple years ago. Is you know, also what position is the best position? To sleep in um you're a chiropractor and i really wanted to know what is the best position to sleep and uh you had a very interesting answer so favorite type of pillow and if you wouldn't mind reiterating best position to sleep in so the pillow depends on how you sleep first and so let's tackle that so how do you sleep i don't know how you sleep but i sleep on my side generally and so why i think that's the case is because when you're on your back you are Basically, your, your body sinks into the bed in a really weird position and your neck, it doesn't matter what type of pillow you have. I mean, look at your, like take a picture from the side when you're sleeping on your back next time or have somebody take a photo of you. It'd be hard to do that selfie if you're sleeping. And Trying to hit the angles. <laughs> and look at your neck position. It's basically the position you're going to be in probably all day looking at your cell phone, looking at your computer. So I don't want to be in that. I think your low back gets pushed into the bed at a really weird angle. Um, so I don't sleep on my back. But if you do, I'll get one of those pillows that are contoured that everybody thinks are magic where you know what they look like they're really round on one side and they dip down they're a little bit less round on the other side and so use whatever angle works best for you so your head's in a neutral position um sleeping on your stomach's just i think really silly because no matter how you do it unless you have like a massage table you're on you cranking your neck one way or another and then your low back also gets screwed there and that i don't know how you would have a pillow on that so use whatever pillow makes sense for you um, on your side, okay, this is the this is where you kind of need to figure out um, how your bed works, how your body works. And so when you think about it on your side, you can put everything in a position, like a very athletic position. So for instance, Anthony Barr, the Minnesota Vikings, when he's going to be lining up to tear off Jimmy Garoppolo's head on Sunday, he's going to be in a very <laughs> athletic position, right? He's going to be kind of hunched a little bit. He's going to be in his hip flexion a little bit. He's going to bend his knees. His arm's going to be up. If you put a pillow in between your arms, in between your legs, and then put yourself on the side, you're going to look like Anthony Barr about to take out Jimmy Garoppolo. Very easy. Okay? And, That's how I imagine myself. Yeah, exactly. And then at that point, what you can do is have somebody take a photo when you're on your side. And basically, you want to fill in that space from the bed to your ear. And that's what the pillow should be. Okay? If you, if you for, whatever, for whatever reason, like firmness, softness, or whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with, that you can get that distance from your ear to the bed to be normal so that your, your head's not sinking to the ground or it's not to the ceiling, 
that's what pillows you should do. And so it, it just depends on how soft your bed is, how heavy you are, how you sink into the mattress, all these different things. But I would urge people to either use a person to fill in that space between your arms and your legs or use a body pillow, which is what I do sometimes. I do a mix of those things. And then fill in that extra space with the pillow and be in a neutral position. And that's my ideal way to sleep. And I think that that's how I recommend most people to sleep. Is this consistent with what I told you a couple years ago? Or did that change my mind? That is. And it just made me feel like, boy, it's, it's super individual, just like everything else. And you just got to keep trying and investing and experimenting with your own health. Love it. Well, how many questions? Like 15, 12, whatever? Yeah, I mean, we span the gamut from nutrition to sleep to nut butter to guitar pedals. So I certainly hope, uh, you know, we covered something that helps uh, the person new to the ketogenic diet or uh, someone not so new as well. Yeah, so we'll do more of these as well. If you guys have any questions, just hit me at the DM on Instagram and answer every single question. Or if not, what I'll do is I'll say, got it, cool, we'll do this in another episode. I will post on Instagram here. If you guys like this one, we will do another episode just like this. But yeah, just at Dr. Anthony Gustin if you want to get in touch about any kind of questions you want there or if I'll put up a new um, Instagram photo for the next round and we'll get some more questions and hopefully we'll start doing these maybe once or twice a month if if good. And then also let me know what you thought of, of Alex as the co-host. Maybe he'll make some more guest appearances. Five star reviews, please. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate your time. And we'll see you next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye.